for managing in person. This is great seeing everybody here um, and hybrid. So um, I was actually terrified to do a hybrid meeting. If I we have really one feeling, little feeling pretty good about it. Problem. Just like got to. But, yeah, but I can't yeah. see my. I, oh, you can't see. I can't see my. You see the problem. You appreciate the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I just That's hit a new it. one for me as okay. well. Try hitting return. Huh? Maybe you don't need the mouse. Try just hitting return. It might. No. I mean, you have to close out of your PowerPoint and do that. All right. Give me a second here and we'll get going. <laughs> Yeah. Well, as he does it, welcome um, today's speaker. You probably all know uh, Dr. Yandel very well. Um, so he's speaking on artificial intelligence enables comprehensive genome interpretation and nomination of candidate diagnoses for rare genetic disease. So right. welcome. Well, with that, I'll just jump right in. That title was a little long and unwieldy, so I changed it for the purpose of today. Uh, Jim AI for genome interpretation. Uh, Jim is the name of an algorithm um, that I'm going to sort of explain the genesis, the motivations, the applications, and the performance of here today. Uh, before I begin, uh, by way of UI, I'm a co-founder, SAP member, and consultant for Fabric Genomics, which as you'll see as this talk unfolds, played a major role in what I'm going to present here today. So in 2006, the March of Dimes released a report that, as the years have passed, has proven really um, a game changer for um, newborn health worldwide. And this is a document that points out that about 8 million children a year around the world are born with some kind of birth defect of genetic origin. And it's a cause of significant mortality. Uh, both first, second, and third world. They also pointed out that neonatal intensive care units were often by definition the first contact, at least in first or second world nations, with the health system. And so that was the place to begin to detect, intercept, and treat um, these conditions. And they also pointed out that whole exome and whole genome sequences uh, might be used in this domain um, to save lives. Now, um, this project has grown a lot. It's grown, I'm not going to talk much about today, the, um, the UK side of this, but the UK is now gearing up to begin, uh, I think they may have already started sequencing every newborn person in the UK um, and checking their genome. And they have also, uh, House of Lords issued a statement that um, every UK, the goal is to sequence every UK citizen by like 2028 or something like that. So things are moving along there. In the US, which I know a lot more about, um, of course, it's a very different healthcare system. And there have been multiple groups pioneering and deploying whole exome and whole genome sequencing um, in the NICU. And with pretty much hands down, the leader innovation wide with this has been um, Dr. Stephen Kingsmore's group at the Rady Children's um, Institute for Genomic Medicine at Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego. And that project is widely known also as Project Baby Bear, which is an attempt to jumpstart a nationwide application of whole genome sequencing in the NICU and uh, in the PICU. Um, the University of Utah has been involved in these projects for quite a while in collaboration with Brady um, and also Fabric Genomics, which is the main informatics provider uh, for Brady. And of course, here at the University of Utah, we're also leaders in this domain, first through the Penelope program and now through the Utah NeoSeq program. So this is um, a very interesting area because it's both nation and worldwide, and with Utah actively involved in this as far as our healthcare offering. Now, the problem that stands between this idea of deploying whole exome and whole genome sequencing um, in the NICU and NICU for diagnosis is that over time, the rate of genome sequencing, the cost of genome sequencing, the time a lot required to do things like align variants and annotate them, et cetera, has dropped. Um, to be basically insignificant in terms of cost um, and um, um, time uh, required. Uh, clinical whole genomes have dropped now down into the level of around as low as $1,000. 
Um, and that took some well within standard tests for costs. So the barriers now are multiple. Um, they are legal, they are um, technological. And I'm gonna to talk today about the technological side of this. And the number one barrier on the technological side is the time spent to interpret variants. So the average um, whole genome um, sequence generally has, most people would agree, about 3 million or so high priority variants that in theory, each one of which could be disease causing. There are now about six to 7,000 known Mendelian disease genes and so the time spent, obviously, looking through the data and trying to do that by eye is simply impossible. The current state of algorithmic um, applications for this interpretation, uh, prior to Jim that I'll tell you about today, generally deliver um, hundreds of possible candidates in some sort of ranked sorted list. And the idea for interpretation diagnosis is you get together a group of highly skilled, highly educated analysts they're going to start at the top of the list and go down until they find something they think could possibly explain the patient's phenotype. And then that gets referred off to a committee, uh, which is discussed in more detail with experts and clinicians, et cetera. As you can imagine, um, doing this is something of a cognitive overload. It requires very experienced, highly trained individuals, and it's very expensive to get all those people in a room to discuss and, and go over the results. And that really has limited the scalability, even though there's plenty of proof of principle papers out now showing that this works and it's efficacious. Um, if you're trying to scale nationwide, um, that's just not gonna happen. And so, um, Jim began as an international academic industrial collaboration with eight different groups um, around the world. Um, the motivation being to throw AI at this and see if we couldn't come up with a way to speed and, um, and, and um, to speed that interpretation and make things more scalable. Um, the project was primarily organized by uh, Fabric Genomics. Uh, with the various academic groups you see here, um, contributing um, data analysis, discussion, et cetera. So um, the goal of Jim is to provide fast AI-driven diagnosis of rare disease. And going into this, um, we focused on several key goals um, with the idea that they weren't necessarily achievable, but by stating them, it really said what we would be after in the ideal. So first, it's essential that the tool be genotype and not variant-based. The phrase variant prioritization is very commonly used. There's a ton of tools for it. But in the real world, Mendelian disease, the operative cause of Mendelian disease is a damaged genotype, not a damaging variant. Every, that's true of every autosomal recessive disease. Often the damaging genotype is what's called a compound heterozygote, where there is one damaging variant in the gene on one chromosome, a different damaging variant on the other. That significantly complicates analyses because now at every locus, you have to go through and look at every possible pairwise combination of variants. So that's a real problem. The other problem is not all variants are the same. There are single nucleotide variants, short insertions, deletions, copy number variants, for example. So the tool needed to work on all of the different variant types that were present in real cases. Another real issue is this AI technical um, thing called explainability, which is that a lot of AI has this black box aspect to it where it gives you the right answer, but you don't know why or how it came to that conclusion. It's been made very clear that for these kinds of technologies to go mainstream, that AI must be explainable. In other words, you must be able to explain why the machinery came to the conclusion it did. Finally, we really set the bar high for what we were trying to achieve, namely that Jim, given a genome sequence and some accessory data, would identify only one candidate, and that would always be the correct candidate if there was a genetic reason for that child's disease, or Jim would say definitively no. There is no evidence of genetic disease in this candidate. <laughs> it is for a, sick, for a different reason. And that Jim would always be right. He would never, ever make a mistake. <laughs>
So that's the goal. Of course, that's not probably achievable in the real world. Um, but what I'll show you here today is we've, we've come surprisingly close. And it says something, I think, really about the power of AI on this data. Now, to achieve those lofty aims, it was pretty clear that Jim was going to have to integrate um, a diverse set of data modalities as its knowledge base and also be able to compute upon these very heterogeneous collections of data types. The inputs to Jim are basically an annotated BCS file with or without um, structural variance. <coughs> Clinic notes, either in the form of just the raw text, PDFs, the Word documents, etc., that have been used in the hospital system to um, describe what's happened to the child, the physician's opinions as to what might be caused it, um, or what's called an HPO-based phenotype description provided by the clinical care providers. And I'll talk more about that as we go on. Jim has access to the contents of OMIM, ClinVar, the human phenotype ontology, the gene ontology, the contents of Nomad, et cetera, all extracted, transformed, and ready for AI activity. So it's truly a huge database of knowledge. It's transcended upon you know, anything ever thinkable about by a human being. It has all the data associated with the 1000 Genomes Project down to the read. And so Jim actually has a model for what's going on at every site in the genome. All right. Um, it knows all about all conservation at every site in the human gene. In, um, gene uh, based on all other sequences um, available from the Santa Cruz browser. Um, it knows, has specific modeling locations about gene locations, where they're at, X autosome, uh, X chromosome, centromeric, telomeric, etc. It knows about all splicing, etc. And at runtime, it's also going to calculate a variety of additional parameters directly from the, the patient's data. Uh, um, genome data. It's going to dynamically determine the sex of the individual that's trying to diagnose. It's going to define both at their best estimates for their global ancestry. Are they European? Are they African? Are they Asian? But also, it's going to compute a gene model using the NOMAD data at every site in that individual's genome to guess whether that site, its most likely ancestry, that transcript, that gene, and that region, etc. Um, it's going to um, look for, quantify um, consanguinity. If consanguinity is present, it's going to identify LOH regions in that individual that it believes are due to that consanguinity and adjust its models to take that into account. For example, if you were in an LOH region due to consanguinity, if there was a damaging genotype, there's an increased chance it would be a simple recessive, just to give you an idea. It knows whether or not, you, if you tell it, parental affection status, are the parents healthy or they have the same phenotype, et cetera. Um, you can provide it with parental sequences as well in the forms of duos, trios, et cetera. And it's also going to compute a variety of data types that are sort of new to the field um, and use those in its calculations as well, most notably the concept of ploidy as opposed to zygosity, which proves especially useful for CNV uh, determination. Um, to do all of this, um, Jim is also going to integrate some key external executables. It's going to integrate um, some algorithms that have been written and published by my group over the years. The VDT, a probabilistic variant prioritizer. VAS, which is a burden test-based genotype prioritizer. The tool called Fever that combines phenotype <laughs> information with genotype um, priorities and truploidy to deal with consanguinity in those LOH regions that I told you about. It's also internally going to bring additional, and in some cases, really quite innovative algorithms to the table to process the primary data as well. As I said, it's going to determine things like ancestry and sex. It also has a very powerful variant called adjudicator within itself, where it's going to take all of that data in the BCF file as it's submitted together with depth of coverage and everything, reevaluate the variant calls in a probabilistic fashion, taking into account things like sex, <coughs> ancestry, gene location, et cetera, to reevaluate those variant calls. And in many cases say, GATK said it thought there was a variant here. I don't believe it. Or in some cases, as I'll show you quite strangely, even when there is no variant, 
Um, and finally, uh, the tool provides full support for CNV detection, um, powerful means, and I think very innovative means for CNV discovery, adjudication, and prioritization. Okay, so another key thing here is all of these things are embedded in an AI framework that means each component is being used to optimally reinforce and inform the other. So really there is no isolated piece of this. All of these things are constantly talking back and forth to each other at runtime um, to decide uh, what's going on. Now, this is sort of giving an idea of how Jim works with respect to its AI component in one slide. And it's a whole talk at the very least could be based around this slide. But just to give people that are interested in the idea, um, the key um, thing around Jim, as for so much AI today, is the simple idea of a conditional probability or what is the probability of A given B? And of course, that is defined by a simple identity, which is the probability of, of the joint probability observing A and B divided by the marginal probability or simply the probability of B. Importantly, um, this basic identity of probability um, theory also applies to discrete and continuous variables and combinations of them, which is important. And if you think about that identity there, you'll see you can simply cross multiply to see that there's a very simple relationship between a joint probability and a conditional probability. Now, these the relationship can be extended to an infinite number of variables. For example, the probability of observing A and B and C can be rewritten as a conditional probability statement that that's the probability of A given B and C times the probability of B and C times the probability of C. All right, these kinds of statements can describe very complicated events. For example, the probability of observing A, B, but not C in the context of D. And we can flip back and forth between those joint and conditional probability statements. So how does this get applied to the kinds of calculations we want to do in GEM? For example, the simplest case would be an example such as this. We want to say, what is the probability that a variant is damaging given that ClinVar has supported it likely pathogenic status, that the variant is on the X chromosome, that the individual is male, that it's sitting in a gene associated with X-linked recessive inheritance, that the annotated consequence of the variant is a missense of, of variant, um, that VDP has afforded a 93.932 or 93.2% chance that it's damaging and vast to 96. What is that posterior probability? And so this is a relatively simple case, of course, in this case, it's going to be very near to one, but if we were to change the sex, it would become very near to zero, right? Because a single variant like that in a gene, right, is unlikely to be responsible for disease unless it's in trans to some other variant or it's homozygous. Mm -hmm. So all of those kinds of calculations are being assembled. Now, all of this is simply the well-known chain rule of probability that everybody's familiar with. But this chain rule has a couple of other key things that are very useful from the extent of AI. First off, um, any conditional probability or joint probability statement can be written in an automated fashion using a simple recursion. In other words, Jim can dynamically write these statements as it runs and evaluate them as needed. Okay. Another key thing here is that every conditional probability is also a Bayesian posterior probability, meaning that the whole Bayesian um, machinery and inference and everything can be brought to bear on these calculations as well. And so all of that up to here is just how, I don't know, uh, most of modern ML and AI works. How, what part of Jim is actually AI? Well, part of it is that it is going to dynamically formulate conditional statements based on these conditional probabilities and then do something. Sometimes what it does is just move to the next gene. Sometimes what it does is formulate another conditional probability statement and evaluate that dynamically and do something else. All of this taken together makes Jim um, a form of AI called a forward chaining inference engine. 
Um, and that's a widely used AI technique, and that's at not the 10,000 foot level, an idea of how Jim is doing all of this. So there are potentially um, multiple areas of deployment for a tool like this, but today we're going to focus on the NICU. All right. So as I said earlier, the NICU is the first encounter with genetic disease. Children that have genetic diseases tend to end up in the NICU because they're sick. So that's the place to try to detect this. And current estimates suggest at a level four NICU, this is the most severe kind of NICU, about 18% of the patients in the NICU at any given moment are there because they have a genetic disease. Genetic disease is the leading cause of mortality in the newborn intensive care, <laughs> in the intensive care units. And importantly, disease progression is very rapid in infants often. It is vital that they be diagnosed as soon as possible. But complicating that is the fact that for many genetic diseases, the children present normally at birth with normal APGAR scores, and they go downhill after that. In fact, one of the, the first genetic diseases discovered solely from computational uh, means was with FAST and um, 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 Ogden syndrome here in Utah, and those children are normal at birth, and it's in the subsequent weeks that they develop um, problems. Okay, so one of the things going into this project that everyone agreed about, just like we agreed about the goals, was the importance of benchmarking. And this whole field from day one has been really plagued by the absence of realistic benchmarks. And so we wanted to assemble a benchmark data set that would consist entirely of real patients. And more importantly, we'd have access not only to their genomes data, we'd also have complete access to their clinical records. All right. We wanted an all comers data set that it was just individuals from the NICU or PICUs around the world. Right. And we wanted something called a benchmark and a validation cohort. And I'll explain what I mean by validation cohort in a moment. And we wanted to make sure all the tools in our benchmarks were run correctly. If there was an external tool being used, we corresponded, or rather Barry Moore did, with the authors of that tool, told them what we were doing, and went back and forth until everyone agreed, including the author of that tool, that the command line being used was optimal for its application. Now, we really benefited from the participants in the study on this. Lady Children's really opened up um, their resources to us, and they assembled a retrospective case, 120 cases from their rapid whole genomes program, all di clinically diagnosed with a genetic disease, and it's a representative all-comer set of every kind of disease, every kind of variant, you name it. Um, presented in their NICU over like about a five-year period. Uh, so it's ancestry diverse, the whole bit. Um, second is the validation cohort. It's a smaller data set. And what this is, is um, five different institutions from around the world, each with their own variant calling pipelines, their own clinical cultures, et cetera. Um, also giving us their data so that we can compare what's known as transportability of the AI. Inevitably, AI is trained on one data set deployed elsewhere, and so is it going to work well in one place but poorly in another, et cetera? And that was the purpose of the validation data set. But what we didn't have in this data set um, was BAMs. They proved elusive, too heavy to move, etc. BAMs are the basic, the reads for the genome aligned to the reference genome, and the final seem to be extremely large. Not having access to a BAM really compromised our ability for CMV detection. Ultimately, though, this turned out to be a good thing because it nourished further innovation. Now, this is the primary two benchmark figures out of the paper, and they're fairly straightforward. Um, what we're looking at here is how often the various tools ranked um, the diagnostic hit as the top hit in the report within the top two, five, and ten. And the quick take home here is Jim is powerful, quite a bit more powerful 
um, than the other tools. And the second is that Jim's AI is very affordable. When we look at the, the performance across that validation data set, it's basically unchanged from its performance on the benchmark data set. So we're not dealing with problems of overtraining on local data or anything like that. Now, we wanted to go beyond these traditional benchmarks, though, um, because there's something very important about how GM works. It's very different from any algorithm in this space so far. And that has to do with how GM, what GEM scores are and how they're handled. And so, as I said earlier, the principal problem with interpretation of GM's data is where to stop. All the tools up until GEM have given you a ranked list. And you're going to start at the top candidate with the highest score and start working down with some idea that as you go down, the variants of the, the genes you're encountering are probably less likely to explain the probands phenotype, but surely the true positive is enriched near the top of the list, ideally. The problem is you stop at the first hit, the fifth, the tenth, the three thousandth, et cetera, with the idea that it's literally costing probably about a thousand dollars. Um, a gene to evaluate it. So go 10 D, it's cost you 10,000. You can't really get to 100 realistically, right? So it's really important that people have thought that the list should be short, all right? Now, if we look at the gem data and the way these things are, are usually presented, what we want to know to answer this question is perhaps less obvious than if we recast that exact same data as a cumulative distribution. And so now what we're looking at is the pro is how frequently the true candidate was in the top, was the top hit within the top two, within the top 10, within the top 30, et cetera. And so you can now see some characteristics of these lists that emerge is very interesting. So first off, Jim converges at 100% far more rapidly than the other algorithms, right? By 10, you're basically at 100% on the benchmark data set. Fever is getting there, but in fact, you have to go out to about 100 um, to get there. And Examizer, um, another big tool in this domain, is never getting there. Um, not even if every report you evaluate all 30,000 candidates will you ever climb even to 80%. And as I'll explain later, that has to do with CNVs, but that's coming a little later in the talk. But you might think the thing to argue here would be, well, with Jim, you know, you can stop at 10, just evaluate 10 in every hit, and that's a lot better than the existing tools. But we wanted to take it further than that, because the fact is every case is different. Sometimes you need to evaluate more. Sometimes you need to evaluate less. And so Jim provides, I think, a very innovative answer to this question in an explainable fashion on a case-by-case -case basis. In other words, Jim is going to tell the interpreter how many genes they need to look at for that case to find the true positive with a given um, um, accuracy. And the key to this is that GIM scores are something called Bayes factors. A Bayes factor denoted by K here is simply the ratio of two posterior probabilities, okay? And for our purposes, the numerator is going to be the posterior probability that the gene is damaged, and that explains the proband phenotype given the data, versus the gene is not damaged and does not explain the proband data. So it's very similar to a likelihood ratio test. It's just the Bayesian equivalent. Gene scores come with guidance, just like p-values. And p-values, we think 0.05 or less is important. A bit larger than that isn't. Generally, a log 10 of a base factor um, between one and two is interpreted as strong support for the model. In this case, that that gene, if it had a score of one, explains the data. Between 0.5 and one, substantial, less than 0.5 is weak, and more than two is considered decisive support for the conclusion. So what you're looking at here is that same frequency plot recast as a function of the base factors associated with the probands. And down the middle here, we have a threshold base factor. On the right, we have the median number of candidates in the 
in the proband that pass with that base factor. And on the left, we have the true positive rate. In other words, the probability that the true positive is in that list. So for example, if we threshold our reports on a gym score of 0.69, substantial support, right? A moderate support, right? Oh no, substantial support. We would on average uh, need to, not average, median, the median number of candidates that need to be reviewed would be three. And we could achieve a 95% true positive rate. If we wanted to go all the way to zero, in other words, instruct the interpreters on every report to evaluate any gene for which there was any evidence that it might be causative, no matter how small, we would simply threshold at zero. For these data, that would give a median number of candidates that would have to be reviewed of 10 to achieve a 99% true positive rate. All right, some individuals, you might only have to look at one because there's only one candidate above zero. Some, you might have to look at 20 because there were 20 candidates above zero, right? But you would be able to answer the all important question for explainability. Why did you stop at candidate seven in this report and not go on to candidate A? Because the base factor was less than zero, and thus the data at hand suggested that it was not a candidate. Okay, that's what we mean by explainable AI. Now, important in these data, and an example of just how heterogeneous the data are, is that phenotype is all important for diagnosis. Um, and so, I show you, let me just show you something else about these benchmarks here. If we look here, you can see there's one tool that's doing quite poorly compared to the others. And I know what that tool is, that's fast, and I wrote that tool. Why is it doing so much worse than the others? The reason is VAST knows nothing about phenotype. Jim, fever, and eczemizer do, all right? And so what you see <laughs> here is a reference of about how well you can hope to do if you can't compute on phenotype data in this whole game. And the quick answer is you're not even in the race, all right? The problem is, and there are multiple problems. First off, with regards to variant interpretation, it is a truly Herculean task to ask a physician to go through what can often be weeks of clinic notes on a deathly ill child that's having every imaginable test and health crisis you can think of happening and produce a succinct summary of what's wrong with that child for downstream computation. Not only that, that computation, though that summary has to take a very precise <laughs> machine readable form. So the physician has to be trained as to know how to do that. That's a very expensive, time-consuming process. And it's one in which what you're looking for may change on an hourly basis. Because as I said, the child's phenotype is always evolving early on because the nature of Mendelian disease presenting in newborns often goes from normal to dead uh, within 24 hours. Now, potentially, um, a kind of algorithmics called clinical natural language processing could be used to automate that process. And I want to take a brief aside and talk about that as well. So in my role as associate director for the program in personalized health, I've been working for a number of years to oversee a process, a process whereby we would convert every medical, um, clinic note in our medical records database at the University of Utah, about 77 million clinic notes, into structured data in the form of machine-readable phenotype descriptions based upon the human phenotype ontology. Rady's children has an identical pipeline in place, and so does Boston children's, meaning that this process enables some very interesting um, areas for algorithmic development, and it's proving very powerful towards those ends. But I don't have time to talk about that today. Now, this is just so sort of devotes an intuition as what a patient's phenotype looks like after their clinic notes have been processed. This is the HPO phenotype description for an actual radi proband that was diagnosed and used as benchmarking in this study. And you can see here, um, each term has an ID and it's a brief description of what might be wrong in the events encountered um, 
um, in the NICU as that child was being treated. And that's what we're going to try and compute upon and combine with all of that other data and see how it works. So this is um, a uh, figure from the paper. Um, and what you can see here is here we're looking at manual phenotype descriptions that were assembled using HPO terms by the attending physicians versus those that were derived automatically from the natural language processing software. There's one big difference in the two is the software puts out a lot more terms. The mean number was 177 as opposed to four. So it's far richer, uh, but machinery doesn't get tired and it maybe doesn't value concise and it's noisier. Um, the big important thing here is any way you look at it by rank, by base factor, true positive rate, et cetera, Really, the worst you could say about the comparison is it doesn't matter to Jim whether it gets a phenotype description from a physician or by NLP. Um, if we look by rank here, you can see they're not dramatically different. If we look by Jim score, they're also um, not dramatically different. And what that means is that we're no longer bound in terms of scalability um, by meeting physician-mediated review of the clinic notes. Another really interesting thing that emerged in the paper is that Jim doesn't need trios. This is a similar benchmark looking at trios versus singletons, again, with respect to rank and Jim score for both clinical phen NLP phenotypes and manually described ones. And again, basically, you can't really see a difference to these results. Now, that's huge because that means instead of sequencing the child and both parents, you only need to sequence the child. At about $1,000 a genome, that's a two-thirds cost, but it's even more important than the money is often in these cases, it's simply impossible to get one or even, even rarer both parents. So it relieves that necessity. It's not the trio data can't be important for a particular case, but at scale, it doesn't matter. All right. So I've talked to this point about um, this bottleneck of scalability for deployment of whole genome sequencing in the NICU and PICU. I've told you how Jim has bypassed these bottlenecks uh, with respect to GM scores, giving guidance to precisely how many genes and which genes need to be reviewed for a given case. The fact that it can work equally well with manual versus automated uh, phenotyping and that there's less need for trios in the process. What I want to turn to now in the last part of the talk is Jim and copy number variants. This is a very interesting and a very important area. And one reason it's so important is no matter how many genes you review, you're never going to get there unless you can handle copy number variants. It's estimated, current estimates put the number of cases in the NICU that are there due to a copy number variant at about 15%. And indeed, that's about what we have in our data sets for this paper as well. <clears throat> that's got to be a lower bound, an absolute lower bound, if you think about it. Because if you've ever dealt into this space, you know detection and prioritization of copy number variants is really hard. Um, and so, You've got to be able to deal with them, but it's really hard to get there. So Jim is so hard, a bit about um, CNVs, copy number variants, and why they're so difficult, uh, such difficult targets for discovery and prioritization. The first is that current CNV callers have very high positive rates. There are many thousands in every whole genome sequence. All right, whether that individual is healthy or not. Mm -hmm. And so that significantly complicates interpretation there. Um, also, CNVs are just like other variants. They need to be scored and prioritized with respect to phenotype, mode of inheritance, and severity. And that's a complicated problem because you take two CNVs that overlap, one's longer than the other, and overlap some other, some additional genes. How do we relate that to the proband's phenotype? And does that initial overlap contradict that is the longer it is a candidate or does it help confirm it? 
Um, the other very important thing, which should be made relatively positive, uh, obvious by the high false positive rate, is that CMPs aren't necessarily causative. Um, they need to be prioritized in the context of SMDs and short indels, because just because you have a 50 megabase deletion on one of your chromosomes does not mean that you're sick. And so um, sorting that out um, is, is quite difficult. And even when they are causative, it's important to understand that the genotype is still the operative entity for disease causation. All right, so they need to be considered in the context of overlapping CMVs. Maybe you have this autosomal recessive disease because you inherited two big CMVs on their own, one from your mother, one from your father. They only overlap in a single gene, and that gene is associated with an autosomal recessive disease model, right? Um, sometimes that cause of genotype might consist of a CMV and in trans, an SMV or a short indel, and that's responsible for the disease. So now you're looking through every possible CMV, every possible SMV and short indel, and every possible combination and trying to prioritize all of that with respect to phenotype. And of course, to make matters even more complicated, a lot of your CNVs are triplications, duplications, quadruplications, et cetera. And so how those combine to cause disease is frankly poorly understood at any locus. And so how do you prioritize and understand those as well? So Jim takes a very different approach to CNVs. So first off, at runtime, Jim systematically evaluates every gene and transcript for CNV. Its model parameters include things like the depth of coverage of that gene, the probability of observing or not observing variants in the gene. So for example, if NOMAD has 10 variants in that gene that are all present in 50% of people, the probability of none of those being in the DCF file for a homozygous, if there isn't a homozygous deletion there, is simply the product of those probabilities. Likewise, heterozygosity can help inform this, right? If we see the variants, but they're all rare and they're in a homozygous state, the probability of that in the absence of consanguinity is the product of the frequency. Again, very informative. Also, um, things like link, ploidy, is it a heterozygous, is it a duplication, a triplication, et cetera. The sex, whether or not it's on the X chromosome, et cetera, is important. The phenotype, the genes in the, the, the CNV, et cetera. And importantly, priors derived from the thousand genomes data. All right. There's no need for an external database of known disease causing CNVs. You can use one in Jim, but you don't need one. Jim is going to learn everything it needs to know about CNV stakes from the thousand genomes data plus the input provenance file. All right. There's no requirement for a BAM. If you have a BAM, Jim can use it and it's going to do better, right? But if you don't, Jim will discover CNVs directly from the VCF file at runtime, solely from that data in the absence of any BAM. All right. All right. Also, external CNV callers are welcome. If you want to run one, Jim will use those and operate upon them. But if you don't, it will also create its own external CNVs and use those as well. Um, and it will figure out which best explain the data. And you can use as many CNV callers as you'd like. Um, so we are now running the standard Dragon pipeline at Grady. Um, that's all the Dragon plus the Mantis. So generally about 2,000 CNVs per program. Um, so the take home is Jim will find CNVs and prioritize them even if you haven't looked. And I realize that sounds sort of crazy, but let me show you some results from the paper. So in the Radies benchmark data set, there were 14 whole genome individuals where the diagnostic genotype involved a CNV, and they're all shown here. Now, the first thing you should notice here is that in every case, they were ranked the top hit in the GEM report, and the median number of hits in the gene in the report achieving a base factor greater than zero was one. In other words, every time it got it, and in one case, there were two, but hits 
Um, but mostly there were sorry, two cases, but mostly there was just one hint. It was what you were looking at. Now, it was a source of some confusion to us when we found out that we had found all of the SV cause, SV, CNV associated genotypes um, and prioritized them correctly when we discovered that for reasons in data transfer, et cetera, four of the cases, their VCF files contained no external CNV calls. And so what we realized was what was happening here is Jim was automatically inferring the existence of these CNVs directly from the VCF file and scoring and prioritizing them correctly. Now that led to the no brainer um, um, uh, experiment of simply removing all of the SV calls from all 14 of these uh, probands. Now what you can see in all but one case, we precisely recapitulate um, the external SV calls, even though we have no access to the BAM. We miss one, a very small deletion for which there's no, there are no human variants contained in that deletion within NOMAD, that region within NOMAD. And so there's no information one way or the other in the BCF. So sure, very short. CNVs can't be detected without a BAM. If we have a BAM, we can get that. But interestingly enough, that's maybe not as big a problem as you might think, because it appears that there's a strong bias towards longer CNVs for NICU patients, which sort of makes sense because they're more likely to be causative. So Jim identified 13 of the 14 causing CNVs without recourse to any access to a BAM or external um, CNV calls, um, which um, is pretty interesting because it gives you peace of mind that even if you didn't look, you're likely to still find that diagnostic CNV. And it's especially useful, and I don't have time to talk about today, for reanalysis of older cases. So many individuals have been sequenced over time. In many cases, there was no diagnostic candidate the question is, might they have an SV? The idea of reprocessing that sample, recalling, uh, and looking for CNVs is a complex one. If you have the legacy BCF file, Jim can discover the CNV um, with a high um, accuracy, even in the absence of any SV calls. Now, just to finish up here, I want to walk you through an actual example of sort of Jim AI at work. Um, in the domain of identifying um, a C and D-related genotype, because I think it really sort of shows you how all of this comes together. Uh, the proband here is a European female with no signs of consanguinity, and for this case, it's trio. We have the mother and father's genomes as well. The diagnostic genotype is in a gene called Tango2. It is the top hit in this report. There are two hits in this report. Um, this hit with a gym score of 2.2, you'll recall that that's called decisive level of support. Another gene uh, with a score of about 0.6. Um, and so the other thing I didn't have time to talk about today is that Jim also gives something called a MIM score. Jim doesn't just determine the cause of the genotype, it also tries to, to auto nominate a diagnosis, a genetic diagnosis to that proband. And Jim believes that it's this MIM here, uh, that this child has a disease called metabolic crises recurrent with rhabdomyolysis, cardiac arrhythmias, and neurodegeneration due to a damaging genotype within the Tango 2 gene. Here is their HPO phenotype description that we're going to compute on together with their VCF file. And let's look at, at what we get as we sort of walk through this. So superficially, um, when Jim begins to evaluate these data, this seems a bit of a no-brainer. Um, there is a single variant um, that transforms a G to an A in the BCF file that was called um, as homozygous. In other words, its zygosity is two. This gene, Tango2, is associated with autosomal recessive inheritance. More than that, this homozygous variant is a known Kronbar pathogenic variant. And so Jim looks at that data in its first pass and says, Okay, that's a no-brainer. This kid has metabolic crises recurrent with rhabdomyolysis, cardiac arrhythmias, and neurodegeneration due to this homozygous known pathogenic genotype. 
um, in the Tango 2 gene. But Jim, as it begins to grind through its gears, um, discovers something else, that um, there is apparently, well, a few facts, some paradoxes here. So this variant essentially has a frequency of nearly zero in Nomad. I think it occurs twice in all of Nomad. And so the question is, given some other facts, that this individual shows no signs of consanguinity, how would the individual become homozygous? As I told you, it's a trio, and it turns out the father is heterozygous to the variant, but the mother lacks it. So Jim has this paradox, which is that where did the other variant come from? It could be de novo, but it's very unlikely that the child would experience a de novo mutation producing exactly the same base pair change at exactly the site of the inherited Clinvar variant from the father. What is that probability? It's on the order of 10 to the minus eight. Jim knows it. It creates that conditional probability statement and determines that probability. So that's weird. The other thing Jim found out is that there is evidence in the DCF file, even though it doesn't have a BAM or external SDs in this case, of a heterozygous deletion that is 24 KD long um, that um, appears to overlap this supposedly homozygous pathogenic variant. All right, and Jim is quite certain, given the data, that there is a heterozygous deletion in this gene. So now there's really a paradox here, and it's rather an obvious one, which is you can't be both homozygous for a single nucleotide variant and then have a deletion on one of your chromosomes overlapping it. And so Jim is going to ask next, well, okay, something's wrong here. The variant caller says that the individual is homozygous, but I've just discovered this, and it's very unlikely that it would be a de novo event. I know that variant callers are not far from perfect. And in particular, I know a lot about the variant calls for this individual because I have 3 million of them to look at. And so what Jim decides is that the most likely thing here is that in fact, the variant caller made a mistake, that in fact, this variant is heterozygous and it's in trans to this hypothetical deletion that Jim thinks is, is supported by the data. When Jim looks at the probability of that explanation, you can see that base factor jumps dramatically, tenfold, right? It's become really decisive. So that is by definition, a dramatically better explanation for the genotype than the superficial one there um, in the VCS file. And so this is, I think, well, so here's the final um, reported genotype in this case, and it is the Sanger confirmed phenotype, almost to the base pair, all right? I would point out that even though Jim evaluated every gene and transcripts in the human genome for deletions, duplications, et cetera, this SV is the only one in this individual to achieve a Jim score greater than zero. And so this is, I think, somewhat remarkable that all on its own, Jim figured out there was something amiss here that it inferred, prioritized, and reported the correct diagnostic genotype, even though that diagnostic genotype is nowhere present in the input data. And in fact, it had to override an explicit assertion by the variant caller to do that. And I think that case really summarizes what's so different about the approach here. And just to finish up, <clears throat> some summary slide, but to make it short, a gym is fast, it works, it's being used all over um, the nation right now as we speak. There are kids, um, multiple children probably having their genomes run through this thing. Um, but more than that, um, there's a lot more on the way. The paper's been out um, over a year now. The amount of progress is really dramatic. It's almost not even the same tool um, in terms of functionality and also precision and accuracy. Uh, we're getting very close to that hypothetical one or none scenario um, and fact more quickly than I ever would have thought in part because we're getting access now to so much data uh, from around the country and the world with individuals that have been uh, diagnosed by Jim.
Um, just some acknowledgements here. Um, the paper's out, you want to read it. Um, over 100 scientists and engineers participated in this project. Um, you know who you are. Um, the Utah team, the Fabric team, the Rady team, and the New Zealand team. Um, but I'd like to hear in Utah, I think especially Barry Moore, who created the whole dang benchmarking pipeline and a lot more um, to get together all those benchmark studies. Um, when we started that project, we both had long, luxurious Fabio-like hair and looked both of us now. Um, I'd like to thank Javier, um, who has really borne the brunt of getting Jim applied locally for a lot of our program projects, such as the PCGC and the AHA um, Foundation grant. Um, at Fabric, Erwin Frise, the head of software, Francisco de la Vega at Stanford and Tempest, uh, especially King Stephen Kingsmore for being always so focused on getting the need available so that we can improve the standard of care, no matter what the lawyer said. And finally, Martin Reese, CEO and president of Fabric, who was able to negotiate all of this um, and deal with things like differences in international law and consent statements and everything. It's important in this domain, I think, as a, a PI, if you're going to increasingly do clinical research, you need to envision the future having a team that consists not only of molecular biologists and computational people, but probably a full-time lawyer in the lab as well to deal with all of these things. And with that, I'll just say thanks to everybody and take some questions here. I want to ask about the, the none part of the one or none diagnosis. So how how do you how can you teach Jim to um, not call things that are not there? Because your 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 training data is people who have gene confirmed genetic diagnoses. How do you, what about the sure? You know? So the quick answer there is a case that has none would be one in which there are no scores greater than zero. But if you think about it, even a positive case has every case has like 20,000 genes in it. And so it's actually easier to learn none, you know, than yes. And so it becomes very powerful, very fast at distinguishing true negatives. Uh, true positives are harder because we're limited. You know, usually there's only one per case. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah. I kind of have two questions. The first, um, that was a great talk, by the way. The first is when we've used single phenotype terms or just two phenotype terms, the HPO appears to be incorrect. In other words, the, the way the structure of the ontology doesn't make it becomes increasingly hit or miss. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and so, so the way to do that is feed it more phenotypes that are, that are sort of um, relevant or. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the second question that we struggled with is sometimes the variance will be scored as positive, but it's not, there's a, there's a note in OMN that says it may be autosomal dominant, but if you look at the literature, maybe it's not really autosomal dominant. Mm -hmm. All right, so I got great answers, I think, for both of those. Okay. So first, the phenomenon you talked about where you only have a couple terms from OMIM to describe the patient gives it this necessarily hit or miss aspect to it. And even though I said the worst you could say is that there's no real difference between the natural language processing described descriptions and the physician, when the physicians are term or there's a paucity of terms, you're probably better going with the natural language processing just because the all those terms just sort of balance things out. You don't have a false negative problem or some sort of weird bias because you know it hits some weird term. Um, second, um, that what was the second part again? Um, in some cases, omen, omen. Oh yeah, yeah. This is just quite the bugaboo. Um, right now, there's a lot going on in terms of scale up for these applications for newborn screening where you don't even have phenotype. And as Karen knows, I will literally like just even rant at the kids about this, whereas the typical cases, there's some well-known Mendelian recessive disease at that locus with some terrible phenotype. And there's some one paper from like, you know, the late 90s where they got together the extended family and put them through a variety, variety of tests and measurements and discovered that like, okay, even though the child, the proband in the family, you know, has no eyes or arms, there's a statistically significant excess of, of early onset glaucoma in this family. 
And so we're going to call it an autosomal dominant disease as well. And so OMIM is just full of those things. And I too don't know what the answer is because nobody's going to take like Mark's version of OMIM that doesn't have things like that in it. Now, I don't even know, if, I don't even think that would be a good thing. So it is a real problem. And especially around autosomal dominant disease, the power of all of these tools is less for autosomal dominant than it is recessive. So Mark, uh -huh. could you prioritize the list of OMIM? diseases and our genes that they should look at? I do, and I have that list. No, I have not. I have not, but I do have a list that I'm working on on that with basically high par genes based on the thousand genomes data. There are autosomal dominant diseases that are present in like, you know, like 15% of the thousand genomes has, I think it's coffin serous or something like that, which can't possibly be true. Right. Um, so, yeah. So you guys, so clearly, right, uh, you know, lethal diseases or early diseases are going to be more severe mutations than lesions. You guys tested gem on diseases that might be less severe or have mutations that are maybe not predicted and damaging your gain of function mutations. Well, I think overall we're in a space here. I mean, you know, about 50% of the target cases we're trying to diagnose are ultimately going, the, the children are going to succumb to the illness. So we're definitely in the space of really terrible, bad genetic disease with this. Um, I think, as you can imagine, is pen, Jim does have a model for penetrance and everything like that. By default, we set it at 95% because we're looking at highly, for highly penetrant alleles. I think it gets a lot harder. There's a lot inf less information there. You see that in the gym scores when you look at that, they become depressed uh, simply because it's harder to say much about, you know, a variant say that's in the father associated with like a, you know, relatively mild disease and the proband has it in the father gut and, and everything. So I think there's just less power. It's not even really a gym thing. It's more like the nature of the data those are harder targets. You guys test any cases yet like that? Or? Um, we have, yeah, um, there's quite a bit. Jim also puts out in its report something called an incidental finding. Um, and so we see a lot of, you know, incidental findings, like, for example, uh, um, you know, things associated with like um, um, sense of normal hearing loss that tends to be alleles and and genes that are associated with, you know, you, you go deaf after like age 11 or 12 and stuff like that. And it does seem to get a lot of these kinds of genes cases, but I couldn't begin to speculate at all, you know. Uh -huh. I have something on the chat from Phil Moose. Um, have any race-based issues been seen or not? So, well, that's, uh, there are a lot of, of race or ancestry-based issues here. And I think one thing with Jim is we work very hard is to overcome those. Now, it's a classic statement that genetic disease doesn't discriminate, uh, but it does in a sense. So, for example, um, some genetic, I don't know if disease is the right word here, but consider glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. About 11% of African men have an allele um, that if they're treated with various malaria um, um, drugs or they eat, I guess it's fava beans, they get a form of anemia that can be quite severe. Um, that's probably not best not thought of as a disease, but it's really, you know, ancestry specific, just like CF is basically absent from Asians. So I think knowledge of ancestry and exploiting the different population uh, frequency data out of Nomad is absolutely essential to this process. It, and so if you're not going to begin to spuriously diagnose individuals of underrepresented minority groups, you need to know something about their variant frequencies. And you need to know um, and, and how to operate on that. So, so is Jeff pulling that in? Oh, yeah. 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 OK. Well, I guess we're five minutes over. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all for coming today.